Hello again, Everyday People. This is Mr. G, and this is the second season of Everyday People, where I talk to and interview you, the everyday person. Today's guest is starred in great films such as Creed, Limitless, and one of my favorites for the love of money. He also stars in the current television series, the Wu Tang series on Hulu, also Silent, and also The Underground King. Please give a warm welcome to our guest, the great man, Brian Anthony Wilson. How are you doing today, sir? Thank you. I'm doing great, great Joe. Pleasure, pleasure. Good to see you. So how's everything with you? Now, as of today, it's late. As of today, everything is doing well. I mean, um, I'm, I'm working. I have some stuff lined up, a couple of jobs. Um, That's great. One I can't really talk about, but it's uh, working with somebody who I actually worked with before, but I'm thrilled to work with this, this TV project. And then um, I have to go out of town for, I think it's five days of shooting, four travel days, down and back, down and back to uh, Virginia for it. Where I'm, I haven't played a cop in a while, I'm playing a detective, a homicide detective, a lot of hunting down the serial killer. So that's called Finster. And wow. Uh, yeah, so things are, uh, you know, it feels almost like it's somewhat a sense of normalcy because mm -hmm. I used to be kind of busy. But um, I mean, I, and I thank God for this, uh, you know, that I am able to get between different realms because I used to do a lot of theater before the pandemic. And, right. um, and I also would have a lot of conflicts with theater that I couldn't do some film and TV work. TV work. So now it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's a yin and yang kind of thing. I'm sorry about not having theater work, but right. I have, uh, a lot of theaters have kind of turned it, not I should say turned it back on me, but I haven't been given any opportunities with them. So thank God that I have the TV and film to pursue. I mean, TV and film is much more lucrative, right? right. Payment-wise, it takes up less time. But, you know, I, I miss theater, but uh, yeah. especially live theater. But I can't get what I'm not offered, so that is true. Now, with that being said about the theater, now is that due to uh, the current situation we're in with uh, COVID in regards to that, or? Um, it's two twofold. Okay, George. Sure. So yes, COVID has certainly affected theater. I mean, Broadway shut down. You know it's serious when yeah. Broadway shuts down, and it shut down all of the local theaters to places that I've worked with. But uh, most theater companies that I know of have uh, rebounded with putting on online uh, streaming productions. Okay. Um, and I have auditioned for a few of them. I didn't get them, uh, which was like a mixed blessing. The two things that I was up for that I didn't get, I will be actually working on now. Okay. And it would have had been a conflict with the uh, the Wu-Tang thing, this other production that I'll be working like, well anyway, it's like five days of work, so. Right. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, one door closes, another door opens. But uh, that said though, there are, uh, I think, Look, I think diversity and inclusion is a problem that has plagued the Philadelphia theater community for, for years. Well, that's, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, there are theater companies who, who have been in, in the forefront of that, where they've uh, cast a uh, diverse and inclusive cast, and, and they've done non-traditional casting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did a production of, um, two productions actually, at People's Light, one of um, Diary of Anne Frank, which I played Mr. Von Don, who oh, was wow. Jewish, you know, yeah. so I'm obviously, well, I should say I'm obviously not Jewish. There are black Jews. Yeah. But anyway, there was some kind of uproar about that when we did that. Um, but that was, you know, uh, sussed out with the Jewish community and, and uh, did a lot of workshops. And we actually all went as a cast to the Holocaust Museum in, in, in DC, which was very eye opening and just disturbing and alarming, but right. also very moving about the power of, of the Jewish people and of them persevering these, the, you know, I've always had a, an affinity, I think, with, with the Jewish people and, and I've, I've seen an affinity between Jewish people and black people because we've right. all, we've had that struggle, the struggle. Running, you yeah. know, certainly slavery and, and uh, you know, the Holocaust mm -hmm. and the concentration camps, I mean, we've, we've all had this, uh, we both, I should say, both communities have had this struggle to get past, but but anyway, um, right. I was diversing about, but some, some theater companies have been on that. We also did a, a production of uh, a, an all black and Latino production of All My Sons, which is traditionally, you know, it's an Arthur Miller piece, but it's traditionally about a white family, but right. uh, it was a black woman, Camilla Forbes, who, who heads the uh, Apollo Theater now, 
she directed it and um, it was a lot of the cast, like five members of the cast from a production of Fences we did at People's Like wow. the year before. So they said oh, it would be nice to have that parallel between these strong uh, men, one an entrepreneur, uh, and all my sons, and you know Troy, the, the um, garbage man in Fences, and both the same actor played the, the, the patriarchal figure in, in these productions. But anyway, yeah, so some theaters uh, are being diverse and inclusive and, and trying to uh, have reflect more of the community that they're in. And right. some are kind of uh, kicking and screaming to keep the old way going. So, so when I say, um, yes, uh, theatrical productions, nobody's doing anything live, really. There are a couple things happening now, I think, that are starting in maybe April, or maybe start rehearsing now and produce an uh, opening in April. But uh, for the most market. part, yeah, yeah, it's been online stuff. So, but um, yeah, so personally, there are theaters that I've I thought that I could uh, I shouldn't say count on because you shouldn't count on anything, right? right. But that I would have had an opportunity with that uh, I didn't. So, um, but that's that's the business. Yeah, and so um, really is the nature of it. But yeah, the thing, and, the thing and, I know. took away from all that is like when you got these roles, there was some controversy. Con con it was controversial at some point, but yes. what you did was you took that situation, did your own due diligence, and want to learn about their culture so you have a better understanding and respect for it as you play the part for the roles. So, like you said, there's hurdles and ladders when it comes to being in this industry, especially oh, yeah. in the theater industry. It's like you have to be patient. Sometimes the role doesn't come. Sometimes there's other you know elements that evolve, you know, that are involved in you know getting you the part, but. It, it's kind of one of those things where it's a hurt to wait process kind of like you get the you get you may or may not get the role but you know you still got to study the craft and on top of that you got to be willing to understand there might be some backlashes in some of the parts you get oh yeah so I mean that must I can't I can't fathom how tough that probably was with the backlash or anything maybe it was subtle I don't I don't know but it's one of those things where it's just like yeah, I'm I mean, playing a different part with a with a different character, playing a different part with a different culture, and then you know trying to understand the history of that culture is like, why am I playing this role? The whys you told me that about the before when you're doing acting. It's the main thing is the whys. Why am I? Why is acting like this way? Why is acting like this? So, yeah, it's interesting that you that you spoke on that because it's like some of the things not a lot of people hear about that. In no, to the backstories to you know in theater in the industry itself, you don't hear the backstories of you know certain things and certain elements that you know delay or may just stall some of the actors out. So it's very interesting that you shared that with me. Yeah, and and it was interesting when we were doing it. I mean, uh, that's the that's the first thing I asked. You know, after I got cast, I was like, yeah. well, why am I a black man playing you know portraying a Jewish person? So, right. and they were like, well. Uh, and again, they, they, they vetted, that's the word I was looking for yeah. before, they vetted a lot of people in the Jewish community about, you know, uh, multiracial casting or non-traditional casting. Right. And, um, and they, you know, uh, and they, they did a lot of discussion about it. And again, there are black Jews. And the thought was because there are people in 2021 who are denying that the Holocaust ever happened. Oh, and there are yeah. kids who don't really know about what the yeah. Holocaust was about because it's several generations removed now. So it's right. like several, two generations, I think. Right. But um, the part of what what attracted me, you know, to be able to do this classic piece um, and also work with this phenomenal cast and this, I mean, you should have seen the, the production, the way they layered the, uh, People's Light is really great about um, yeah. their uh, set building and all that. And we were, it was very claustrophobic, I mean, and there was like a thing, maybe almost a little bit wider than this, because I almost fell one day and, and girl was playing, and Frank, who was an Asian young lady, caught me, because there was like a little lip and then, you know, there's the floor, you know, so, um, but um, the, the part of it was to show empathy, you know, mm -hmm. because I think there's been empathy between the Jewish uh, community and the black community for years, but, um, and also showing it like if a, a young black kid can see a black man up there playing a Jewish person, mm -hmm. maybe that can, that can help them want to explore the, um, the Holocaust, want right. to explore the Diary of Anne Frank and give them a way in. 
um, exactly. you know, and also to show, you know, hey, it could happen to anybody. Exactly. And that's kind of part of, well, I mean, I want to go to that. Yeah, but I understand, like, what, what you're saying is it goes, all, it goes all back to that representation. Representation is key to make someone interested in learning more about yep. what it is that exactly. they're, they're looking at. You know, that was the biggest thing back in the day that people were, you know, pressing for more representation of multi-diversity, different colors and different races. So little like kids viewing it will have the idea, if I can see them do it, I can do it. It, it helps reinforce that encouragement of getting out there and, and, and doing and striving and being better than what you are the day, the day before. So it, it's good that now in our generation and a generation before, they acknowledge that and they work towards making that a better thing. Not just for us now, but for generations ahead of time. So you know, that was it was good that they planted that seed. Yeah, exactly. So, like just like and another thing is where you have, I think they just announced that they're putting back on uh, Disney Cinderella with right. with uh, you know Brian Brandy, Brandy, yeah, and the yeah. late late great Whitney Houston. Just yeah. so little black girls can see, hey, I can be a princess too. It's not just little white girls. They've done a black Annie, and you know, just so they like you said, the representation. When I take my kid. You know, I used to take her to see a play. I would love when I saw, you know, somebody like her has a has a wide nose and curly hair yeah. up there on that stage, so she can see that and say, "Hey, I can do that too." It's not just for only one person; it's for everybody. Exactly. What was the journey like for you? You know, coming into this industry, what what couple, what hurdles did you have to go? You know, go through. Well, you get yourself established. Honestly, George, I was so freaking brilliant from when I started. I had no hurdles. It's been very easy. Very easy. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, I will tell you, I started years ago before you were born. Mm -hmm. I have ties older than you and underwear older than you. Mm -hmm. Just letting you know that. Fair enough. Fair I'm enough. jealous of your youth <laughs> and talent and voice. But anyway. Uh, just trying to get like you. <laughs> but back in the early 80s, I think it was 84, um, mm -hmm. I used to sing with an a R&B band called Perfect Blend. Wow. So I, I went to Freedom Theater to, because I wanted to improve my vocal range, and they had a, a you know, voice thing. So I, I don't even know who sent me there, but I went there as part of their curriculum. It was like a six-week thing. As part of their thing, that if you were a vocal person, you still had to take a movement and an acting class, which I did, and which culminated in a... Um, showcase at the end of the six weeks and so then I did that really loved it and I saw somebody do this monologue and he, this guy is actually my friend now a dear friend Mel Donaldson and I was like damn I want to try that so right. the next semester I went back as an acting major so I was in class for two weeks and then uh, with the late great uh, Patricia I can't think of her last name but anyway amazing actress yeah. um, teacher and after being in class two weeks, I was thrown into a play. Um, not because I was great, but they, they had fired two people and they needed they needed a body in there. Okay. And I had no I had no idea what I was doing. I was acting and singing in this. But thankfully Johnny mm -hmm. Hobbs Jr., who was my mentor, a great Philadelphia legend, was in this play and uh, I learned from him watching him. John Allen directed it, the late great Johnny Allen from Freedom Theater directed it, and I just learned so much. But I was in a play before I even saw a play, which is kind of bizarre. Wow. But that's how I got started. And, uh, you know, I did the play and still continued. I studied there for about four, four and a half years. I was in a bunch of productions there and a bunch of workshops. Actually worked with um, another late, great, Entezaki uh, Shange, who, okay. who wrote for Color Girls. I wow. A, I did a piece really? where I played a psychiatrist with her. In one rehearsal, we went over to her um, house and she made us plantains, and it was like, wow. I, I, I was like, my mind was blown, but I got to work with her, with so many different people at Freedom Theater, but that's how I got my start. And then from there, I, I started at Bushfire Theater, another black theater in West Philly. Al Simpkins gave me the chance to do these leading roles on stage, which again, I learned from very much on the job training, as, as well as still taking classes. Wow. And my, my first film, The Postman, was like that. I had no film experience. Uh, I flew out to meet Kevin Costner and he offered mm -hmm. me the role after talking about it, but zero film experience and I just learned on the job now, watching what, these veteran now, what actors. what was that like, you know, coming into something like that major, Postman, first ever, you know, production that like you're on and you're seeing all these people, you know, you're seeing how everything works. What was that experience like? 
it was mind blowing, man. It was, it was surreal. I mean, I put something. This is how long ago it was. It was on VHS tape that I had. Mike Lemon did me a favor. Mm -hmm. I put this. The character only had six lines, even though I had to work it on it for five weeks. But he had a lot of screen time. But I put this audition on tape. They FedExed it out to LA. They liked it. They said, we're going to fly you out to meet Kevin. If he likes you, you can be prepared to stay for 10 days. If not, you'll be on the next flight back to Philly. Right. So they flew me out to Tucson, Arizona, where he was location scouting. And then he got there, and uh, I was in a room with him, like this close, mm -hmm. 15 minutes. We talked about the movie, the role, and my lack of experience, just but I did have theater training. Yeah. And he offered me the role right there, which was just like, I'm in a room with an Oscar winner. Wow. And I'm no, I mean, I'm nobody. And he just offered me a role in an $80 million film. Which I mean, it's, it's really different for every project. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I just get as much information as I can. And, you know, certainly script is king, so hopefully you have a great script that kind of gives you all the information. But mm -hmm. there's usually more you have to ask. A lot of writers that I've worked with for TV and film stuff, um, they have backstories, which is, which is great, you know, for you as an actor to hear mm -hmm. what motivates this character you're portraying. You know, all the little clues that make this person, who, you know, so you can make them come to life. And then just be as true as I can. I mean, I, I need to know, you know, what this person does, what, you know, what motivates them, uh, what, what their wants and needs are, especially, you know, in the realm of the, the script, you know, script is king. So it's a, a myriad of, of, uh, of uh, tactics. I mean, I, Years ago, I played Malcolm X, so mm -hmm. at the time, that was before all of this stuff was available. It was probably uh, like early 90s, something like that. Right. But, you know, I'm more goofy because I was bald and, you know, had my little goatee and found the glasses and all that stuff. But I watched stuff that I could watch it on him, you know. Certainly, it would be a lot easier now. And, and uh, you know, listen to the cadence of his voice mm -hmm. and, um, you know, read the autobiography or bits and pieces of it. And, uh, you know, did that due diligence. And I played, you know, Thurgood Marshall, so there's a plethora of information about him and, you know, what he did. Uh, you know, there's video of him, I have audio of him. So, and in that, in that thing, I had to portray like 15 different characters. I mean, FDR, I had wow. to do Eleanor Roosevelt's voice. So, but luckily, there are all, there's plenty of information about all these people out there. So, you do your, you know, you do your due diligence and, um, hear and see what you can about the characters you're portraying. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a person who has just been, you know, written out of the ethos, you know, again, try to get as, as much information as you can from the writer, director, and what you, and about their, their profession, you know, um, that the person you're portraying is, and make sure you're as true to that um, representation as you can be. Right. Wow, so it's a, it's a lot that goes into, you know, developing yourself for the character. It's a lot of, it sounds like a lot of studying and just, you know... Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's studying, but also just kind of knowing what makes this person tick. Why they say what they say, how they say what they say, yeah. how do they walk, how do the they... the why's, it sounds you know, like. Yeah, 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 the why's. Yeah. You know, which is, it's weird, I don't know if it's, I'd say it's harder, but when you're portraying a, an actual historical figure, you know, I think there's more um, expectations of you, you know, when it's somebody who's, who's just, it's a new character, you're creating this character that nobody knows how they walk and act and talk, you know. I think one of the greatest compliments I've ever gotten as, mm -hmm. a, as an actor was when I did Thurgood. And I had this, they had this lady from the Lincoln Center, I believe. She had this wig that was like $1,500, $1,200 wig. I mean, $2,000 wig. Wow. And that I had to wear, you know, and I had a wig person every day when I did the one man show. But uh, we had a talk back with one of uh, a law clerk who actually worked with Thurgood Marshall. And at the end of the show, I did my little one man show. It was like two 45 minute acts. He, well, he gave me a hug and he was like, thank you 
it felt like he was alive again. And I was like, I don't think I'll ever get a, a big as, you know, um, compliment as ever. And somebody who actually worked with the man, you know, said that to me and I was kind of blown away. So mm -hmm. I would walk out and sometime and some people were like, he looks just like him because I had the mustache and, <laughs> you know, the wig was amazing and yeah. the suit and all that. I mean, and I'm, I'm a big guy kind of his, of his stature and, and his complexion, but I, you know, I did a lot of research on that and I watched a lot of things and listened to him and read. I probably could have did, I mean, I know I could have done more. That right. took everything I had to give and still asked for more. So, yeah, but that's, um, that's part of the prep. That's part of what you do as an actor. Wow, that's great. And they really fixed, they, it sounds like they really fixed you up to play the part too. I'm they did. They, was it a lot of makeup or was The it? late great, oh no, no makeup. Yeah, no uh, makeup. What late great uh, Walter Dallas directed that. He, you know, if I had been, I, sh I should have been better prepared, but I was coming off of playing Troy and uh, literally shooting a film that, that uh, Booker was in. Wow. Um, the day before I, I started rehearsals for that. So I was ill prepared because of probably really having doing too much and taking on too much work. Mm -hmm. But um but you, what was the question though? The question is the formula of how you become the you know, getting a character. Well no, so right, right, right. it was a specific question that yeah, I was trying it to It was the makeup, um, Oh makeup, yeah. No, no. I mean I just I did some stuff with my mustache graying it up because mm -hmm. in, in the one man piece he goes from I think at the time he was 82, but this the, the play takes place two years before he died. Right. So he was like early 80s. So I go from there, but and then he goes back to being a kid, you know, through, you know, throughout the, the whole right. one minute. So there's always a transition in between the characters. So you go from one Yeah, from 80 to right. like 16 and all in between. So wow, that is good. That is. Yeah, it was a challenge. It, it was a big like challenge, but yeah, you, you were up for it. You played the part well. Yeah. So well that sure. you got congratulated on it. Great. Yeah, well, but yeah, had I been better prepared, I think that show could have won a lot of awards. I mean, especially for the late great Walter Dallas in his direction. It was just, it was impeccable. I mean, he, and he saw something in me, which uh, again, I mean, I know we didn't talk about that, but sometimes yeah. people see things in you that you're not even sure of. Like, I, I played Othello twice, and right. I didn't think I was, you know, I'm not a, a, a classically trained actor, but you know, I embrace that, and uh, you know, sometimes people see more in you than you, than you know you're capable of. So, yeah, yeah. that's very true. So, Brian, what would you say to the viewers out there that are pursuing the career field you are in right now? What would you keep them? What would you tell them to keep them motivated and keep going and pursue their career? You know, given the current situation we're in right now. Certainly. Um, there was something I read. Sorry, phone. There was something I read about uh, somebody who, uh, who was giving advice to somebody, and I'm, so I'm piggybacking from somebody else. But you. If this is what you have to do, what you need to do, you'll know. If it's not, you'll know too. It may take you longer, but don't do this for fame or fortune. Do this because you need to do it, because you love it. I'm never going to be rich or famous. I don't really care about fame, but I would certainly love to make more money to take care of my family in, in the manner that they deserve. But you know, at this point in my life, I know that's never going to happen. And I don't care about that. I've been able to be a working actor to work on different things that I love. I get to do what I love for a living, as meager as it is sometimes. And, um, but do this because you need to do it, because you want to do it. And study it. It is a craft. Um, and respect it. You know, um, put in, you know, because I, I, I go back home and see my mom sometime and some people are like, yo! The Josh, that's what this one nickname from the hood. Josh, put me in the movies, man. I was like, okay, you go on 3,000 auditions and maybe get two callbacks. <laughs> uh, you get doors slammed in your faces all the time. You go study and pay money and, and drive up to New York and and back, you know, and, and do these things. And then come talk to me. It's just, it's not that easy. Our job is to make it look easy, but it's not easy. There is a very de definitive craft to acting, you know. And I've been lucky to be in all three, you know, versions of it, or at least three versions of it. There are more, with theater, film, and TV. But 
really study it. Anytime you get a chance to perform or, or work on your craft, take it. If it's a reading, if it's doing a, a scene in front of your family, um, speaking in front of people, doing a presentation, you know, any chance you get to perform, take it and, and take it seriously. You know, there is a craft to it and, and study. Go look at a foreign film. Go look at something that, you know, go, go look at, go to the art museum. You know, immerse yourself in the world of art and um, and be a sponge, you know. And also listen. Listening is one of the most important part of acting, parts of acting. And, and, and absorb pe observe people. Be a sponge, like I said. Uh, be a sponge of human behavior. What The way people do things, the way people walk, they talk the way people breathe, mm -hmm. the way people laugh. I mean, all of that will inform you, but you can't be a good actor or artist without living life. So, you know, live life to the fullest and, um, and be safe, wear a mask. Mm -hmm. I want to thank my guests for coming in. I have this busy schedule to interview with me, so thank you, Brian, for coming in. Quite welcome, that. George. I appreciate that. Honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, likewise. And I also want to give a big shout out to Actors Co-op for letting us use their facility to shoot the Everyday People show. Once again, that's Actors Co-op, collectively creative at creating. And I also, last but not least, want to thank the Everyday Person. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for viewing in. And like I always say, stay focused, strive, and be better than you are the day before. So, this is Mr. G, and as always, I'll see you next time. Take care, and cheers.